All right, guys. Um, today we're going to be talking about the structural analysis of um, CMU, and we're going to be primarily focused on lateral and discuss how to analyze, how to approach it. Um, we'll start off with just talking about basic analysis, how you can approach things, and at the end we're going to do a distribution of lateral loads on masonry shear walls. Okay. So I'd like to kind of start off, you know, um, what you learned in 3610. And on that one, you talked about distribution of forces. You know, you had a base shear here, um, you know, that's being applied here. Or it's the same thing if I apply it here or not. And what, what you've done is once you did took this kind of load, um, you proportioned it using the AC710 um, formula. One thing to note that it is increasing as you go up in story heights, right? That's one thing. The other thing is that um, kind of a, it's, it's not, if you were to take a quick overturning on a building like this, the quick analysis is to apply the base shear at two thirds of height, which is a rule of thumb. So two thirds of height would be right around there. Base shear. In other words, if you were to have a building multi-level, I'm really just redrawing the top one. One, two, right here, right? And you had a base shear, right? That you got from AC 710. And you wanted to kind of figure out what the overturning forces were, where you know, you're going to try to find out what the downward load is and the upward load is. The rule of thumb would be to, um, assuming this is, the heights are all the same, it's, say that's H. This is a level, level one, level two, level three. Um, the quick check to see, like, if your overturning is okay, um, is to apply it at two thirds of height. That's kind of the rule of thumb. And from there, it's kind of what it is, is that it takes the equivalent of kind of that distribution. And so um, that's another way of doing a kind of a quick check if you're checking for overturning forces. So what you would do is you take moment times two, there's the height, the total height of the building, height total times the base shear, right? That'd give you your moment. And then you're a matter of TC couple. So let's just say that's B. So tension compression is equal to moment divided by B, which essentially will give you the up and down force uh, on the two ends, descend and descend, right? So when we look at a masonry, we have to um, think about wall out of plane. We'll go over that more in detail in a in different different time, but want to make sure everybody understands that you know we could always we're always focus on just lateral where the shear wall takes all the load right so if we have a building right here right our shear walls would be located you know along the direction of the seismic load so this would be this way now the question is if you have a wall right here what happened to that? Do, do we ignore it? Do we, do we not analyze it? What's going on? And so essentially, if we were to take a cut section here and try to take a look at it, it would be one of these possibilities above, right? Um, your typical, I would say, conservative case would be if you had just a regular one story building to look at it as simply supported right here. Okay. Now, if you have another level, right, that braces it kind of like a column, so pulls it back, right, um, um, this is really going to be more towards, I believe, um, buckling, right, but if it was a lateral load, you know, all seismic, for example, you would essentially have this simply supported and that simply supported, okay, and you look at it that way. So obviously this one would have more moment just because of the height and all that. 
Okay, and then we have our cantilever wall, okay, where the effective length is, you know, 2 h but really, if you had like a retaining wall or something, nothing's holding it at the top, then it would just laterally um, deflect like that. Now, I want people to understand the difference between these two. The difference is that the base is fixed. So fix the support. And the question is, how are they achieving that, right? If you look at the top one and you look at the bottom one, how are they achieving it? One looks almost exactly the same. Well, the difference is that what you see, let's do a different color, is that this wall is being tied right here and this is grabbing it, right? And essentially what's happening is that it, it's stopping a rotation at the bottom and it's giving its fixity. While if you look at the right here, the wall theoretically ends on top and then maybe they'll just have like one bar in there. You don't see the slab coming and grabbing it, right? And so because of that, theoretically, this is viewed as <clears throat> pinned. And right here, you will theoretically look at it as fixed. Now, you would have to actually develop um, to figure out, um, because you're going to have, um, let's just say this is a negative moment, you'll have a positive moment on that side. You would have to develop that moment on, on this base, which is taken out by the rebar right here, right? So you would have to properly detail it in order to get that approach. And so that's why conservatively, if you're not going to do that, I would say designing is pin pin. If you have like an existing condition and you can't tell, you're going to go pin pin, which is conservative because your moment's not going to be as much because your lever arm starts from here or your, your length is essentially that H modified. Okay. Um, so the next thing is that we have to recognize what a peer is. Um, a pier is really just kind of between openings where we're looking at this as a pier, right? Kind of a small chunk of uh, a wall between like openings and we'll go into that a little more. Um, what you see in the dash line right here is to represent a floor level that's holding the wall. So essentially, um, this is a section of it. Um, and you could see that it's again pin pin right and the question is what do we do when there's like an opening and we'll get to that later okay so then the question is when we look at diaphragms you know we've we've studied flexible diaphragm um Um, from a wood approach and what we said is that you know in this case if your shear wall was on this side right here and on this side right here you know your diaphragm would deflect like that meaning the center would have more acceleration and so this is really saying that if you had like accelerometer on it, you know, how much would that, you know, displace in this direction, right? Saying that you'll have more vertical, more up and down means that it's more left to right here. Um, and then at the ends, just because it's right at the wall, you would have, you know, less movement. So th the question is, you know, let's just say you were on a rooftop. Uh, for some reason you're out there partying right the question is where would you see the least amount of displacement and so the least amount would be closer to the shear walls right here and you'll get the most displacement over here so you'll see more lateral displacement at center right and it kind of makes sense right because if we look at it just from a basic beam if i'm standing right at the support i would barely move and that movement right here would just be caused by the wall deflecting. But if I stand right here, it's already gonna deflect just because, right? And then, then you got the earthquake load that's gonna push you down some more, right? Okay. Now, one of the things that we haven't discussed and it's gonna be time permits is talk about rigid diaphragm. Now, rigid diaphragm is gonna occur if at the, um, instead of having like a, um, 
in this case, it's assumed that, you know, you either have wood or just metal deck, which has no concrete. Anytime you kind of start have concrete or start putting something that's pretty stiff above, um, you get what we call a, a rigid diaphragm. And what that means is that the diaphragm does not deform. So it's, it, it displaces and rotates. So what does that mean? It displaces, right, displacement, and then in this case, it rotates. And you notice that it still keeps the 90 degree um, shape. And that's how you know it's a rigid diaphragm. And so essentially, if you have concrete on top, maybe you have a two-story. I, I doubt that if it's a one-story building that you'd put concrete on top just because there's really no reason to do that. Um, and you could, right? But you would you would tax the entire building so much more um, in terms of um, foundations, wall reinforcement, and it just naturally doesn't make sense in the, unless there's a really good reason why you needed to do that. Okay. So we, we probably won't touch on the subject, but understand that if you do do that, that the um, distribution of your forces actually would totally change on the entire building. How you distribute it to the walls and everything would be um, actually totally different, right? And if you have too many openings, then you have to do a semi-rigid diaphragm, which traditionally no one does it by hand. You would have to use a computer analysis, do some crack section, all that stuff. So that's kind of beyond the scope is where I'm putting it right now. Now, the other thing is that how does a wall um, deform based on lateral loads, right? And in this case, it could be soil loads or seismic lateral loads or even so seismic soil loads. Really, um, the, the assumption here is that this is kind of your pin to pin, right? It's a pin support, a pin base, right? So everything spans vertically, right? It assumes in in this case that there's there's like a roof member tying it in so it pulls it back right distributes to your diaphragm so that your walls that are perpendicular can take the load so the point is to direct the load to the perpendicular walls this way right through the diaphragm so if you have um, ladder load this way right in the building in other words. If we were to draw our building, right, um, the displacement that you see over here, that's this wall, right? And then the perpendicular wall that I've drawn in red right here, where I say all the force will go through, this will connect to a beam, to the diaphragm, to the wall that way, is going to be this wall, this wall. And you'd also have this wall. So this would be deflecting like this. This will be deflecting that way. So in the same direction, but it would be right here. And it'd be deflecting that way. So you can naturally see that how the um, shear wall that's in red will take load because of that. Hopefully you can kind of see what I'm trying to show is just load path, right? So you understand. Now the other thing um, that, that could happen is that, let's just say that. Um, if, if you got pilaster or columns within a wall, theoretically, um, you can actually have it span this way also. Um, what that means is that your reaction of this, this pilaster has to take all the reaction, and the reaction is also through bending. So not only is it going to do this, but this wall um, would also deflect this way. It would also deflect that way. So you have two bending ones due to wall this way, and then the actual pilaster would bend this way, just because of all these reactions that are occurring, recurring throughout. I hope you can see that. Right, so you you gotta make sure that that's where you put the rebar. Make sure it's um, spanning and all that stuff. Typically, it likes to span in the shorter direction, right? So notice how right. 
So the question is, which is shorter direction, this one or this one? We know it's this one, right? So it's naturally we're going to want to do this. Um, and so the same question is, is this shorter or is that shorter? Well, this is shorter, so it's going to naturally want to span that way. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this, but I want to just make sure that people understand that there's not only, um, there's two types of, two groups of irregularities. Um, one is a um, plan irregularity, and the other is a vertical irregularity. Plan literally means that it's happening on plan. Vertical means that it's happening uh, with the difference of level. Okay, so within the horizontal, you know, you have torsion irregularity, extreme torsion irregularity, rain corners, diaphragm discontinuity, um, at a plane offset, um, non parallel system. So we're not going to go through all this, but understand that anytime you have this kind of irregularity, pretty much if you don't have a perfect box, the code dinged you. So you got to be aware of what these um, irregularities are. So that you're aware of where you're going to get dinged. It could be increase in force. Um, it could be like you can't do regular um, analysis. you got to actually do, say, like a dynamic analysis instead of a elastic analysis, which is your linear distribution. Um, and so you've got to kind of consider what you're going to be doing um, through that. So here's kind of an example of a... Um, in plane wall offset irregularity, which means that you can see that the wall highlighted here and highlighted over here. So this naturally, as it goes through, it's going to, the problem with this is that, let's just say that you do have an earthquake load coming in, right? And so what this does is that you're going to have a downward load here. And you notice how it's only just a slab right here? If that slab is not strong enough, and chances are in this case it doesn't look like it, this would just punch through. In other words, you would have a failure here. So what the code would be saying is that, hey, if you got this, you know, and you, you, we want you to put a really big beam here, and we want you to design what we call for Omega. And we've talked about Omega before, and if you like, learned in 3610, it's pretty much to, um, you pretty much bump up your force by a certain value amount. And so that's going to be maybe 200%, um, maybe 250%, depending on the type of seismic system that you have, right? And those omegas are listed in your AC 716, Chapter 12, under the certain table. So um, that's just, again, just as review in 3610. Um, it's a refresher. So if you haven't learned it, um, I'm sure you did, but I'm just kind of reiterating that so you understand that it's not just always a perfect building and all that stuff okay so now this is now the same thing as the other one but it is a plan offset so what that really means is that it is offset from the wall and so what happens is that if you have a lateral force right here right what's going to happen is that it's going to go through this wall but now, you'll have the moment be taken by here and here, assuming there's a column over there, which is fine. But your horizontal load, right, still what happens is that it has to transfer through the diaphragm. Right, so the shear has to go from here, down here, travels right here, and then puts it on this level. So that force actually comes down here eventually. Um, and so now what ends up happening is that this, um, this diaphragm or slab needs to be designed for the additional load, right? And so again, the code dings you and penalizes you anytime you do this. Um, <laughs> you know, the crazy thing is right here, I've actually seen buildings where you have a, a shear wall above, and you don't really have that great of a beam below. And, <laughs> and in a real earthquake, it would literally just break off and then it would just take this floor down with it. Um, which essentially, if you lose a lateral here, that means it's going to take this entire floor out also, right? Um, that calls for a seismic retrofit for a building. Um, if 
people aren't really sure what seismic retrofit means is that it, it's it's got so many difference in variation meaning at the end of the day what it really means is that let's just say that the building's old and think of it as you're like 80 years old and you know this magical doctor says hey you know what i know you're 80 years old but i'm gonna do surgery on you so you're like a 21 year old football player who can really do you're unstoppable right and so the retrofit is you know being that doctor going in there and doing surgery the question really is are you 30 are you 45 years old and you want to be brought to you know being like a 21 year old assuming you know 21 is going to be the prime right um and so the level of retrofit is really going to be dependent on that how bad it is and in this case right here as an example it's really bad right and so and just keep in mind is that sometimes um the surgery required to fix this maybe very little right so you spend very little and you get a huge amount of value that's when like retrofit a lot of times makes sense um because it's you know if if you could save i mean spend ten thousand to save two hundred thousand, why not and for a lot of buildings, they actually have insurance companies that actually look at um ask for a report from a structural engineer to do that analysis um it's kind of like a car appraisal in a sense of how like the mechanic it, mechanic looks at the looks at a car and like you know says you know it's got safety good safety system and all that stuff. So engineers can actually um, write up a report and actually grade a building based off of that, right? And that's, again, outside the scope of this. Um, so the next thing that we're looking at um, is going to be these um, different kind of failure that you have in a wall. Um, you can have a shear failure, a flexural failure, a sliding, and a rocking failure. Okay, so... Um, horizontal um, shear means that your um, horizontal steel is yielding. Um, in a flexure, right, it means that your um, your vertical bars are yielding. Sliding means that your wall broke off from either your foundation or your soil does not have enough passive pressure to push it back. Finally, rocking. Um, means that if there is an overturning and an uplift, that your foundation is is too small, right? And so you're literally going to have the um, building rotate. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it will topple over because what we have is a resisting moment pushing it back, meaning this. If you're to stand like this and somebody pushes you, you might rock slightly, Right, if it's a small push, and then you'll naturally come back to your original state. But if this load gets to be really, really large, right, you're you're probably not gonna recover from it. So that's all you know. You could you can analyze that. You could put all the values, and um, these are like different failures that you should consider and take a look at when you're analyzing a building. Okay. Yes, I'm trying to scare you with all the analysis when you do on a building to make sure that you know. Um, I I just want to make sure that you understand as you graduate and you become a practicing engineer that you know you you are aware that there's a lot of these things that can happen and make sure that you look at it um as we recall we talked about uh, flexural and shear failure pretty much if you have a fatty wall you have a shear failure if you have a tall wall you have a flexural failure and anytime it's between within this ratio you can have flexural and Oh, sorry, shear and flexural failure, right? Just keep that in mind. Um, so I forgot if this was been updated or not, but really at the end of the day, um, being in California, um, here, that's us. California. Um, you're pretty much going to be in seismic design category D, E, or F. Therefore, ordinary shear walls, masonry shear wall is not going to work. Intermediate shear wall is not going to work. You've got to do what we call special reinf reinforced masonry shear wall. And the question is, what does that mean, right? 
Really what it means is that the analysis or the design, sorry, the design for the special reinforced shear wall um, is going to require um, most likely more rebar, more reductile detailing. Um, and so you can't get away with some of like maybe, you know, if you had an uh, old building, it, it could have been what we call an ordinary reinforced masonry and shear wall, right? And so to today's code, because, you know, they found out how much seismic force is really going to be compared to like, you know, in 1900s or something. And so like your old building may just be an ordinary reinforced masonry and shear wall. And so the idea is to bring it up to a reinforced shear wall, you would have to seismically retrofit it. Maybe you don't even, you unload the shear wall and put steel in it or something, right? There's different ways of going about it. But if you're building a new building today in California, you're going to go with a special reinforced masonry shear wall. Um, it, it's, these things are probably not going to work. There might be some exceptions that I'm not aware of, but really, again, you're at special. Okay. And so what that means is that um, the the detailing is different. I'm not going to go into too much of it for the here's your ordinary. Um, here's your intermediate. As you can see, there's more vertical bar reinforcement, right, that you can see. You see there's more. They um, pretty much um, your rebar in ordinary is very little. There's more. For intermediate and for special, there's a lot more. And so this kind of, what's really cool is this summarizes the minimum bars that you need and the location and all the spacing and all that stuff. Oh no, what happened? Sorry guys. Oh man. Um, oh gosh. So, let me just press on this one. It will take me to... Okay, there we go. So um, they talk about what the minimum requirements are, um, the minimum reinforcement around openings. Um, let's see, it's, I guess, in a sense, the same. Um, so they've got these requirements for a special reinforced um, masonry shear wall. So these are kind of things that you have to take a look at. So even if your calculation says like you need one rebar and the detailing says, well, you need to have two rebars minimum, that's where you're going to have to start doing it. So it's going to override your minimum design requirements and all that stuff. They also have hook requirements and all that. So that's what it means to um, design for a special reinforced masonry shear wall. Okay, so we, we've talked about kind of touching up on kind of overall analysis, load path, irregularities, and all that. Now what we're going to be focused on is the analysis or rigidity on a shear wall. And so the question is, how do you distribute the loads on a shear wall? Now, if you remember from a regular wood building, <clears throat> And we'll, we'll compare it to that. Um, in a regular wood building, we would have like a shear wall here. And maybe you have another shear wall here. Maybe it's this whole line or something. And so we were asked, okay, well, what's the distribution of the load on the this wall? Let's call A, B, and C, right? Well, we distribute it very equally, right? So what that means is that if we had this V, this side would get half of V, this side would get half of V, right? We'll take this half of V and we'll distribute it um, pounds per linear foot. So we just literally took just the length and we said that the distribution is going to be half V um, divided by L and it gives me my pounds per linear foot. Right, and in this case, you would have a shorter length. The pounds per linear foot is going to be right here between A and B. It's going to be the same, right? And so um, within a wall line, right, the distribution between A, B, and let's just say there was another one here in C, assuming that meets an aspect ratio, that this distribution, pounds per linear foot, if you have A, you have B and C because it's all equal, right, distribution-wise. Now, with masonry, that's not the case. 
The reason for that is because the wall can crack and has different rigidities during an earthquake. So this section um, is really um, talking about resistance of a shear wall. So what they do is um, they relate it um, back to um, the shear deformation of a wall. So in this case, um, what they have is they take it from displacement of a wall and rigidity is just the inverse of displacement. So um, you have inverse delta is equal to rigidity, right? Right here is important to note that when determining distribution of earthquake loads, its relative rigidity of the wall is that required is not necessarily the absolute value of the wall stiffness. Therefore, walls with the same thickness as shown um, in terms of the equation can be ignored for um, relative irregular rigidity of each wall equal to. Um, so let's see. Um, and so we're going to go through an example and talk about this. So we have this equation right here that's going to be key. And so here's a perfect example. You have wall 1, wall 2, wall 3, wall, I guess it's N. Um, so th the main assumption really is that we're basing everything on the fact that it is um, elastic, meaning that it hasn't gone through any elastic behavior. But again, remember, right? Um, that in real life, in an earthquake, it's going to be inelastic, but we take our R value to bring it down to an elastic analysis just so that we can do basic analysis to calculate everything. So this distribution, even though in a real earthquake will be cracked and nonlinear, we look at it as a linear just to give us a basic distribution um, because it's um, really hard to predict what would happen. So we need a starting point. So this is our starting point. Um, so really when it comes down to it, you have two different formulas. One is if it's um, fixed fixed, which is this case. And in the other case is a cantilever. Okay. So right here, is a cantilever, right? And this is fixed fixed. So you pretty much have two equations to work with and we'll talk about when to use what and when to use the other one, okay? Um, pretty much um, here's a summary of a um, table that you could use, but we're gonna, we're gonna go through the um, calculations first and then we're going to refer to this uh, table and to see how this table um, can assist in your calculations. Um, here's an example. Okay. Here what you have is you have three walls. Wall one. Wall two. wall three and traditionally if you were to do this be, um, um, let's just say this was a, a, a wood project how would you distribute it well it'd be easy um, because okay three walls okay so 100 kips total yeah so your seismic force 100 kips right how would you do this if it was, was not a masonry wall? How would you do distribution? Well, we have a total wall length of 20, 10, 30. So that gives us 50. No, 60. So we take V divided by L, which is our pounds per linear foot, which is V is 100 kips divided by 60. And... That's 1.66 um, kips per linear foot, right? And so we would be done, right, um, if we we're doing a wood building. But it's masonry, so it's a little harder. So what do we do? Now here, when it comes to this, the assumption is that the floor um, does not really support it laterally meaning that 
if the load is coming in this way, truly. It's going to look... They're all going to be what we call cantilever. If that is the case, right, we're going to be using um, this formula, which is a cantilever formula. Right, remember if it was fixed, fixed, it would be this formula. So we're doing um, that. And, and so really when we're doing the analysis or doing the calcs, let's just do it for wall one and take this equation. So, so for wall one, R is equal to one over delta, right? Which is then equal to one. The idea is to calculate H over L first. Height is 15, L is 20. So H over L, your height is 15. Your length is 20, which is equal to 0 0.75. Okay. So right here, what it's saying is that 0 0.75 to the third power times 4 plus 3 times 0 0.75, that is your rigidity wall 1, okay? So if we calculate that, let's see, it's um, 0 0.75, 3 raised, 4 times, 0.75. Plus inverse it. What I get is zero point two five three. And just for entertainment, let's just do another wall. What is H over L for a wall two? H is 15. Uh, width is 10. So that's equal to 1.5, right? So we got one over 1.5 to the third, that's four, plus three, that's 1.5 quantity. So what does that equal to? Five, three, there, four times, three times, plus, I hope I did that right. Zero point oh five is its stiffness or rigidity. Um, so let's look at the table. Let's look at the table. See if um, we have an H over. Oh, I let you. So we have an H over L of. of 0 0.75 here and h over l of 1.5. So the question is that kind of makes sense. Remember this table? We have a cantilever, right? Because it's going this way. h over l, we're saying the first one's 0.75. Right, 1, 2, 3, 4, oh no. I guess this is one, so 0.75 is gonna be, man, um, that's 20, 40, 60, 8. So right around here, and it's right there. So it comes down to, that's gonna be rigidity. So that's less than 10. I don't know, it looks like a four or something like that. So, four, um, the inverse of that is going to be 0 0.25, right? So that sounds about right. Um, the next one is going to be if we take the wall, which is going to be 1.5. So it's going to be halfway between here, so it's going to be around there. So that's going to be 
um, let's just say 20. So 20 inverse is going to be 0 0.05. Right. Um, so and it's 0 0.05. Um, delta, design curve, wall deflection, H over L, and all that stuff. So, let's take a look to see the displacement and all that stuff. So, um, R1, we said that's 0 0.25, 0 0.25 right there. So, we got that. R2, we said it was 0 0.05. And so... What we have to do is we're going to be looking at this, that's 0 0.05. Right here. So we've, we've matched those numbers, right? And so what you could do is at that point, you can go ahead and take a look at the third wall. Let's just do it. We're pretty much there. H over L for wall three. H is 15, L is 30, that's equal to 0 0.5, right? So 0 0.5 um, to the third power times 4 plus 0 0.5 times 3 over 1 is equal to the rigidity, right? So what is that equal to? 0 0.5 times 3. And so you end up getting 0 0.5, right? So let's take a look at the table again for H over L. Um, H over L, we're saying it was 0 0.5. So it'd be halfway right here, which gets it to be it's kind of hard to see at that point. Um, it's actually right here. I don't know, 0.2? Or actually, I guess it would be 2. So 2 inverse would be 0.5. Is that what we got? Oh, there we go. So we got it. Oops. So we got it, and it matches. And so great, so once we do that, we've solved for R1, R2, R3. So the total rigidity is a summation of all the rigidity, right? So you add these up. And it's gonna be equal to 0 0.75, 0.5. Eight zero six, I think, our total. Once you find out what this, oh, eight, no, they did eight one, it's fine. Once you find that, your distribution is just going to be a proportion, right, of those walls. In other words, if you have your base shear along here, which is 100 kips, it's going to be... 0 0.25 times 0 0.806 for this one. Right here would be 100, and that will be 0 0.056 divided by 0 0.806. You see how everything's proportion? And this is referred to the shear along that line. So right here you'll have 100 multiply the rigidity of that wall, which is 0 0.5, divided by the total rigidity, which is 0 0.806. It's just proportional distribution at that point, based on a stiffness. And that 
summation of obviously because it's in proportion the summation of all of that would obviously equal back to 100 because it's just math right and so what they do is they'll say it's 31.4 kips 6.9 kips and 61.7 kips so the question is how does that distribution differ from let's just say it was a wood shear wall so if we did this right and said that the 100 kips was distributed by the length of the wall. What we would have done, uh, because it's 20, 10, 30, let's compare it. So we have 20, 10, 30, right? And the total length was 60. So it'd be this 60, this 60, this 60 times 100. So that's half. So that's going to be 50 kips. Um, this is going to be, was it one third? Yes. So it'll be 33.3 kips. And this would be one six. Which is point one one six. So, so this would be 16.6 kips. You know, this and this, it's pretty close. This and this is pretty off this and this it's close but still a little off right and so here you can't just take a typical um, wood approach and do the analysis so the structure analysis that we're talking about right now is stiffness base and it's specific to this masonry stuff now the alternate would be for you to model the entire building have the correct crack section and apply the lateral loads and you would get a distribution based on your computer analysis that would be the alternate to this okay now, that's the basic distribution concept, right? Which is not that realistic because all your openings is like, you're not going to just have a full height door opening every single time, right? Of course not. So we've got to change it up and make it more difficult. So what does that mean? Um... Now, this is just talking, if you want to um, get into it more, is really how much load is being dragged in. And that approach is going to be very similar at that point as a wood approach is pretty much whatever the wall brings in from a basic pounds per linear foot of the diaphragm. The remainder is going to be the drag. Now, now we're going to be talking about um, an opening. And so when we have an opening, this is where it gets a little... Um, more, I guess, challenging is that um, between these openings, you could refer to this as a wall pier. Pier just means like a smaller wall, I guess. And so in this case, what they've done is, um, if you were to analyze this, it's really interesting. You're going to take the whole entire wall, okay, which is this entire wall, Right. And what you're going to do is you're going to subtract what we call a solid strip. And let's see. That solid strip is that solid strip. So you're going to subtract that and then. You're going to add one, two, three piers. One, two, three. Okay? Back to it. And then that's how you get a um, overall, overall stiffness for this portion of a wall. Okay, so again... To the entire wall... Entire wall, we subtract a red opening, and then we add back in the walls that we have in there, which is one, two, three. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, when we're doing it, this you have to understand that. 
is it a cantilever or is it a fixed fixed system okay we know that the entire wall as we talked about is a fixed based pin top which is cantilever okay now the solid strip that is in between right that solid strip is looked at to be supported between the wall above and below so therefore that is referred to as fixed fixed right and these are assumed because it's between it's held between this top wall and the bottom wall right support it's not cantilevering if you just look at this so this is going to be fixed 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 and all that really means is that we use a different set of equations right remember our rigidity we had two formulas we would use um, um, previously we used the cantilever formula but we use a combination of cantilever and a fixed fix approach in doing it. Okay. So here, um, so essentially that's what we, we just talked about. Solid strip minus, okay, solid minus solid strip. Add back in the piers. Okay. Um, and you could see that even um, the way it's, the deflection is drawn. It's free right here. Notice how here it comes back straight, like this is a 90 degrees. Same thing here, goes and it straightens out. That's a 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, okay? Now for some reason, let's just say that you had a strip right here, let's just say it's a different problem, and that was your strip. Well, because this is not supported at the top, this would be instead of a fixed fixed, it would be a cantilever. Remember, pretty much anything that's right here is cantilever, right? Anything below it's gonna be fixed fixes. I guess the way you wanna see it. All right. Um, so here, okay, you've got a wall. Wall one. And you got a wall two. You have an opening between, okay? So wall one, you would just do it as a cantilever, right? So that's pretty easy. We do H over L. H is 12. L is 12, right? So the formula was, gosh, it was one raised to the third, four plus three times one. There, there, R is equal to. So that's one seventh. We'll match right there, so it's one four three. All right, um, so that's the easy one. That's what we just did. Now here's the stuff. What we're gonna do is we got wall two. We're gonna take the entire wall rigidity, which in this case we know um, is gonna be r is equal to zero point one four three. How did I do that? Because this and this and that. Is the same so essentially we know that we're we've got that and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract this portion of it and then we're gonna add this here back into the equation that's what we do yes so we got to go, I don't remember, remember it, so we got to go back and we got to remember what the equations was. So right here, remember, we talked about equation. So the, the four, um, <clears throat> so this is for the fixed fix, so we would use this formula instead. All right, so what we'll do is we're going to calculate the Strip. And so how do we calculate the strip? Remember, it's, we're using the fixed fix equation. 
So we'll just do the delta because we're going to add the deltas in the soft. So um, remember, inverse of delta is the rigidity. So delta, it's easy because it's going to be h over l. 4 over 12, which is equal to 0 0.33. Yes. So 0 0.33 to the third plus 0 0.33 times 3. So we're left with 1.03. That is your delta for the strip. Here's your solid strip. Um, to the third, 1.037. Okay, 1.03. So then we have the delta for the pier, right? So the pier, your H is going to be 4. Um, and then your L is going to be 4, so it's equal to 1. So that equation is going to be easy because delta is equal to 1 to the third plus 3 times 1, which is then equal to 4 is your delta. And because we have two of those, um, we have two 4s. And so essentially the peers, the rigidity, the math you're going to have to do is going to be 1 over 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4, which is equal to 2.0, okay? And so here is what we're going to be calculating that for wall 2, that the delta is equal to the solid wall minus the solid strip plus the two piers. Once we do that, we'll take an inverse. That's, so this is like a algebra confusion. So we'll do the delta, and then at the end, we'll do the inverse. We know that the solid wall um, is equal to 7. We also, that the solid strip, we did 1.03, it's 1.037. And for the piers, because it's an inverse of that, even though we solved for 4, we had two of them, so it's 2.0. 2.0, so the total rigidity is 7.963. Therefore, R for the entire R2 is going to be the inverse of 1 over the total delta, which is equal to 0 0.126, okay? And so from there, um, you would, to find out the, the relative rigidity of two walls, you'll do R1, which is 143, plus R2, right? Um, and then the distribution would be 143 and then 1.26, and that's how you find the distribution for the two walls okay so it is confusing um it's not confusing it's just very tedious and so you just got to make sure that you're following it now the other thing is that <clears throat> if you can get a pretty accurate thing i would recommend that you can go ahead and utilize this table you'd be kind of drawing points down and all that stuff um, but this is um, a table that's going to be you know, available in your manual. Um, if you take your P exam and you have to do rigidity, um, this table is always going to be in that um, civil engineering reference manual when you get you to your PE and all that stuff, if, if required. I don't know if they'll have this in the seismic portion of PE. I, I, I don't think so. You may be required to know it, but um, hopefully that clarifies or hopefully that's your first time around it and um, you understand it. And so there's another example that you can do that would be posted so that you can kind of get the full effect of doing the distribution for the masonry. So that concludes the structural analysis for the lateral on the masonry. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a good one.